My name is Dan Allen, I'm uh, Associate Professor of Political Science here at AU. Uh, I also uh, direct a Global Studies major and co-direct with uh, Stuart Ernie uh, the Peace and Conflict Transformation Program here. Uh, we're very uh, pleased to welcome uh, students, faculty, and honored guests from the community uh, to hear uh, representatives from the American Security Project, a uh, nonpartisan think tank located in Washington, D.C. has several issues in its portfolio, uh, one of which is uh, the national security uh, the relationship between national security as an issue and climate change. And uh, they've been going to several different locations around connecting with local communities on the importance of this issue. Um, I'm going to introduce our first guest uh, speaker and then uh, the, the, the titles and biographies are so long and distinguished I can't possibly do them all. So I'll start with Andrew Holland, the Senior Fellow for Energy and Climate. Um, Andrew uh, Holland is the American Security Project Senior Fellow for Energy and Climate. He's a Washington-based expert on energy, climate change, and infrastructure policy. He has over seven years of experience working at the center of debates about how to achieve sustainable energy security and how to effectively address climate change. Prior to the think tank world, he was a legislative assistant on energy, environment, and infrastructure for United States Senator Chuck Hegel of Nebraska from 2006 to 2008. He also has experience working in the U.S. House of Representatives for the House Ways and Means Committee and the Office of Congresswoman Rukema. He has a master's degree in international strategy and economics from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and a bachelor's degree in history and economics from Wake Forest University in North Carolina. He's originally from New York City, grew up in New Jersey, and currently resides in Alexandria, Virginia. So uh, please welcome Andrew Hall. Thank you, and thanks all of you all for, for being here. And uh, my my role here is is mostly to uh, to introduce you all to, to ASP, and then introduce you to our, our featured speakers uh, this evening. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the reason why we're here tonight, and the, the science of climate change. You know, we had started doing these uh, these talks, just kind of saying. Climate change is real, and then move move on, and then start talking, and, and that left a lot of questions. So I, I think I think it's important to run through quickly, and I've got some good graphs and good pictures and all this sort of stuff, uh, and we'll run through all that first. But first, I want to talk about ASP, um, and we you heard a little bit, but we're a uh, we're quite a, a small organization uh, based in Washington. We started. Uh, about 10 years ago, a little, little over 10, a little less than 10 years ago. Uh, and we focus on what you could call the big issues of national security. So um, everything from uh, guns and bombs and, and war and peace and, and the Middle East and, and, uh, and Asia to looking at uh, more so, sort of non-traditional uh, issues of national security. And that, that would include American competitiveness and uh, non-proliferation and um, uh, energy security uh, and climate security. Uh, now I'm I'm our uh, senior fellow for energy and climate, so those uh, that's how uh, I come in, into this picture, and, and uh, we talk a lot about these issues because you know if you look over the long term, you have to think about what what is going to affect the global security situation and, and uh, climate change and energy dependence are, are two of the, the largest portion of that. A um, couple of the, you know, they, they say when you, you do your a presentation to tell the audience at, at first exactly what you're going to hear and then repeat that throughout. So what you're going to hear today is a couple of key points about uh, climate science. One, the earth is warming. Temperature rec record is indisputable. Two, uh, the variability and uncertainty are features of the climate system. We can't tell you exactly what it's going to be like next week, nor can we tell you what it's going to be like 10 years from now. And a little humility should be involved. Four, uh, or three, in the short term, we cannot undo climate change. Effects will continue for many years. Uh, and finally, on, on the science, scientific debate is about how, how bad it will get, not whether it will occur. Um, the debate about the existence of climate change is mostly a political debate, not a scientific debate. Um, so, uh, with that, I'm going to run into the science here a little bit. 
And what I'll tell you here is you've got these three guys on, on, uh, on here. Basic science of the greenhouse effect has been understood since the 19th century. And these, these three guys are, are pretty important in, in who started it. Going from left to right, that's Joseph Fourier, John Tyndall, and Svante Arrhenius. Uh, Fourier and Tyndall are Englishmen. Arrhenius is a Swede. Swede. And basically, they started to look at why, uh, why does the Earth have an atmosphere uh, that keeps it warm, warm enough here uh, to sustain human life, but not so warm like uh, compared to Venus, where it's too warm for life, or compared to Mars, where it's too cold for life. Uh, why, is, why is Earth in this perfect space, and what, what's happened? Um, Tyndall connected that further uh, with, by determining that it's greenhouse gases, and Arrhenius did the first sort of uh, calculations. He won a Nobel, a Nobel Prize for it, uh, for calculations on how much uh, increased concentration of CO2 can uh, increase the temperature. So, so, like I said, first, the Earth is warming. This is the, uh, the annual temperature uh, of the, the Earth over the last 130 years or so, and you can see there's a clear upward trend. Now, we can even see even greater uh, when you look at it over, broken down into a decadal time span, so you get a, a lot of the, the fluctuations up and down, so you can see 1970s was the, the warmest decade on, on uh, record, then the 1980s, then the 1990s, then the 2000s, each the warmest decade on record. Uh, and, and I think that that trend is it's continuing. But of course, the, the people will now say the climate has always changed. And yes, yes, it, it, it indeed has. And you can see here, this is uh, the longest we can go back in uh, pretty accurately in the climate records. It's about four to 500,000 years ago. This is from, from ice core records and uh, paleoclimate records, and it's pretty good. Uh, and you can see sea level today uh, is, is quite high in the historical record, but it's fluctuated up and down. Global temperatures, look at that, it's fluctuated up and down. CO2 concentration has fluctuated up and down. So the climate is always changing, that's true. Uh, it's not some something that undermines everything that, that you put out there. But what's important to note is that it hasn't been changing for 8,000 years. Over those 8,000 years, um, I put it to you that a lot of stuff has been happening. Now, in those previous 400,000 years, humans were around, some, or, or some sort of uh, early humans were around. But there weren't many of them. There were 10,000 or, or so around. Uh, for the last 8,000 years, You've seen a re remarkable stability. And what's happened in those 8,000 years? Well, the founding of um, the Neolithic Re Revolution in, in the Near East, uh, founding of farming, cities, towns, um, developments of, of culture, religion, uh, empires, armies, uh, war, peace, uh, literature, the arts, all these sorts of things, I would put to you, uh, were partially made possible by a stable climate. When you have to worry about the, the annual changes in temperature and weather, you, it's very hard to plan for the future. It's very hard to, uh, to, to grow crops and, and think about this sort of stuff. You're just trying to survive. When you, you can get beyond that, you can uh, expand and do all this sort of stuff. But the thing is, we are no longer stable. We're, we're uh, ending that, that era of global stability. Last 200 years have seen a significant move away from those trends, uh, and if you look at this, we, we would have kept a, a continual kind of downward trend uh, with natural forces only down towards uh, the next ice age. Scientists say we had somewhere 20, 30, 40,000 years before the next ice age, but it was coming. Uh, but the uh, the surprising thing is that the opposite has been happening. The temperature has been rising, as I should. So why is the temperature rising? That's the, that's the next question. And it's, it's the greenhouse effect. Uh, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, methane, 
um, chlorofluorocarbons and a series of other uh, trace gases in the atmosphere uh, are what we call infrared inhibitors. Now what that means is it's, uh, they collect a little bit more heat from the sun. Uh, and you know the sun's uh, rays come down to earth, some of it is absorbed by the atmosphere, some of it is reflected back into space, some of it is absorbed by the, the earth and the oceans. And what's happening is that the added greenhouse gases act like an added blanket. Think, you know, it's cold at night, so you put another blanket on, you retain a little bit more heat, you stay warmer. Um, what, what added greenhouse gases essentially are is an added blanket on the earth. So it's, it's becoming warmer uh, and it, it keeps a little bit more heat in than otherwise would be. So it upsets the, uh, the balance. And we can see this on a graphically pretty, pretty uh, clearly. You see an increasing CO2 concentration and this, uh, the, the bar graph there is, is a, a different representation of that same temperature graph I, I had shown you before. So a, a continuing upward trend that tracks uh, pretty closely with that uh, upward trend in CO2 concentration. Um, now, what about, are, are those CO2, is that from volcanoes? Is that from the jungles? Is that from some other place? What's, what's important to note is carbon from fossils, from fossil fuels, has a different carbon signature. It has a different chemical signature. It's, it's uh, C15 versus C13 than carbon from plants, so carbon from the natural cycle. So when you have, so we can see, you can call, call this a, a fingerprint of greenhouse gases. So you've seen this uh, fingerprint of greenhouse gases, and, and of course we see is that, that steadily rising increase in CO2. Uh, we've also seen a steadily rising increase in that, that fossil fingerprint. So the results of, of the increasing concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, global warming. Now, I think this is, again, this is a, another, this is a, a zoomed in graph from the, the 1970s, the, the first decade when it was the, the warmest on record and then upward. And, and you can see, well, look at this. It's been, it's flat, it's flat, it's flat. It's going down five times, it's, it's going down. So, you know, you can cherry pick a, a, a date from when you want. You know, you can say it, the temperature's been flat since 1998. Yeah, but look at the longer term trends, and you couldn't say that about it. the temperature's not been flat since 1997. And the temperature's not been flat since 1999. So, you know, it's the uh, old, old saying, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you can choose what you want, but the, the facts are these, and, and that's, that's how they are. Uh, and, and one thing that I think is really important to know, uh, and kind of one of these unknowns, and I said the climate system is unknown. There, there's a lot of unknowns, there's a lot of science still left to be determined. Uh, but one of the things that's just come out recently is, uh, see this, this red line, is that we saw the, the increasing heat since, this is since about 1970s, mid-1970s, there has been increasing heat going into the atmosphere but the vast majority of the increasing heat has been absorbed by the oceans. Um, and water, of course, has a chemical ability to absorb a, a lot more heat uh, than, than air can. Uh, so it, it's been absorbing a lot of this heat, and we simply don't know what effects that's going to have and where that's going to be, but it, it's an important part of it. Uh, finally, before I, I turn it over and, and, and introduce our, our featured speakers here tonight, I, I want to kind of just look back at it, and not in hindsight but the, the the foresight from the past and this is the uh, you can see on the back is this is Jim Hansen a famous climate scientist his model from the late 1970s uh, and what he expected the the temperatures to to do were, were within that that Delta there down the middle and you can see that he was uh, seriously undercounting the effects of global temperatures. So um, not all models have been perfect, and, and in fact, uh, there's still a lot of work being done. Some of the most uh, powerful uh, computers in the country are working on this right now and, and trying to figure it out, but it still doesn't mean it's, it's done and complete. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of work left to be done. The, the military worries about this, and that's what we're here to talk to you all about. 
Uh, and that's what our, our two featured speakers are here to talk to you about. And I'm going to introduce them now before I, I get off the stage and, and turn it over to them. Uh, first speaker is uh, Lieutenant General John Castellan, a retired uh, U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, General Castellan is a native of Crockett County, Tennessee, uh, and he grew up on his farm near Crockett Mills. Uh, he, uh, he's a Marine aviator, flew more than two do dozen different aircraft, including the CH-46 Sea Knight, the TAV-8 Harrier, MV-22 Osprey. Uh, over his 36-year career, career, he served as a staff officer on several high-level military staffs in Europe, Asia Pacific, and the Middle East. His last active duty assignments were in the Pentagon, where he oversaw marine aviation and the Marine Corps, Corps budget creation. He's a member of ASP's board, and we're pleased to have him here with us tonight. Uh, next to him is Lieutenant General Arlen Dirk Jameson, U.S. Air Force retired. Uh, General Jameson served as Deputy Commander-in-Chief and Chief of Staff of U.S. Strategic Command before retiring from the Air Force in 1996, after more than three decades of active service. Uh, he was responsible for a headquarters staff of 4,000 men and women and participated in num numerous nuclear forums with leaders of the Russian Federation, strategic ro rocket forces. Uh, he, uh, he literally had his finger on the button at strategic command. Uh, and uh, we're, we're pleased to have him join us here tonight, too. So thank you all, and, and with that, I'm going to get off the stage and turn it over to General Castellan. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, before I get into my normal spiel, uh, I'd like to say a couple things. First of all, uh, you know, it's a real pleasure being here tonight. You know, we were a little late because of a traffic mishap. But when we got here, you really made us feel at home. Uh, I tell you, being over there and, and meeting uh, the faculty and uh, talking to the students uh, was really encouraging. Uh, really enjoyed it, uh, being able to do that. You know, there, I've, I've talked with a, a lady from Korea, uh, a gentleman from Mexico, a lady from Ohio, uh, and, and it's really uh, it, it causes me to be enthusiastic about the future of our great country uh, when I see uh, these type of people. Uh, my, believe it or not, one of my favorite quotes is from Adolf Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at one time, as we were getting ready uh, to think about declaring war on the United States, uh, you know, his advisors was telling him, hey, you know, we need to be careful about these people. And he said, ah, don't worry about it. They're a nation of mongrel dogs. <laughs> and what he was trying to say was because of our diversity and because of the differences in religion, culture, the origins of the citizens that uh, we could not come together, we could not defeat somebody like Germany. And of course we did, and we continued to have that spirit that animates us at, at, here in the United States. So thank you for reinforcing in me uh, you know, the, the faith that I have in, in our country. So thank you very much. Uh, you know, Dirk is here, he's an Air Force officer, I'm a Marine, and also I'm from Tennessee, as was announced, and uh, Dirk's from Texas. You know, he's quite proud that he's a fifth generation Texan. <laughs> and, I, you know, I've had a lot of challenges from Texans. Over my <laughs> I was commanding general of the 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing, which is located on the east coast of the United States, when uh, we invaded Iraq in 2003. And, uh, you know, sent a lot of Marines uh, to war, and, and somehow or another, I got left behind. And uh, they said, hey, you know, you weren't smart enough to figure out how to get to war, so, you know, we're going to put everything, all the Marines on the East Coast under your command, uh, while everybody else is over in Iraq and other places. And I said, oh, I said, okay, that's fine. <laughs> and I get a phone call one day and said, hey, the President of the United States is going to come down to North Carolina, and he wants to see the Marines and sailors and the families of those uh, uh, Marines and sailors that are there. And you know, you didn't get to war, so you're going to have to host it. 
So the president comes down, he flies in in Marine One. Uh, the Marine helicopters are what carries the president around wherever he flies in a helicopter. We welcome the president. Overnight, I had had my military engineers build a stadium to see 3,000 people out of plywood. You know, Marines are pretty good at doing stuff like that. Especially when we have press coming, you know, and cover us and talking to the president. So the president comes in, you know, I welcome him. We go to the stadium, he speaks at the stadium. And then we had other venues for him to visit uh, around Camp Lejeune, where we were located. One of them was the mess hall. And so we wanted President Bush to feel really at home. So we put a bunch of Texas sailors and Marines at the table so that he and Miss Laura could, you know, chat as they ate at the mess hall. And uh, they had a nice lunch, and they got back in the limousine, and he had asked me to ride in the limousine with him. And uh, how the limousine, you know, the limousine is, is long from here back to, to the end of the, the room there, and it's bench seats. So the president, first lady were right here, and then I was facing them in another bench seat like this. And he got back in the limousine, and he said, hey, you know, that Marine from Amarillo, what a great Texan he was, and I really enjoyed talking to him. And that sailor from Texarkana, what a great Texan she is, and I really enjoyed And he just kept on and on and on and getting louder and faster, and finally he ran out of breath. I saw my chance. I said, Mr. President. He said, what? said, if you Texicans had done as good a job of holding your part of the wall at the Alamo as the 26 Tennesseans in Texas history would have done. <laughs> Not long after that, I got my orders to the desert. <laughs> but Andrew was right. You know, the, the military has a very uh, pragmatic approach to threats. And quite frankly, uh, we have plenty of them out there now. The world is not a safer place after a decade of war. We've got lone wolves enabled by the internet. We've got uh, groups of non-state actors like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others all around the world that are looking to do harm to us. We've got failed states like Libya. We've got rogue states like North Korea. And then we have other nations who desire to rise to peer level and compete with us, such as China. You know, I was stationed in Europe for uh, three years during the Cold War. And, uh, you know, all my European friends uh, looked at the Cold War period as being the era of the long peace because. You know, the Soviets sort of kept their client states in line, and we kept our friends in line, and we had a stability uh, that, for the rest of the world, uh, that has been rarely seen. And then when the wall came down, and then uh, uh, we uh, saw that happen, and, and we said, ah, oh, peace is here. And then what we've seen since then, of course, is, is this unleashing uh, sort of the world in a normal condition with all these conflicts going on between cultures, between religions, between people uh, with ideas. And so, unfortunately, that's probably going to be at least a generation long, this conflict, this potential threat for this. And I'm not trying to bring gloom and doom here. Not at all, because I think, going back to what I said in my opening remarks, that we have a nation that's resilient enough that not only military, which should be the last option that we have, but our ability to address all the threats that are going to be uh, coming against us in a variety of ways. Now, uh, the military has approached climate change, security issues, in the same manner we approach most uh, threats. Okay. The first thing we do is what we call uh, intelligent preparation of the battle of the IPB. And 
what you do is you you do an analysis of what's going on. Okay, we sort of know what's going on with the threats, and but uh, that's you know the people and all that are associated with that are just one factor. The other factors are terrain, weather, and all of this. And then, so what are we seeing uh, with the weather, uh, with the climate, you know, with what's going on? Uh, we're seeing uh, events like in uh, on our east coast in Miami, uh, where we've had an increase in the number of floods in the uh, coastal zones that are impacting people's lives and buildings and structures and uh, those type of things. Well, why do the military care about that? Well, we have the largest naval installation in the world in Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk Naval Base. It cost us billions of dollars. There is a direct threat from the rise of the sea level to those billions of dollars that we've invested in Norfolk Naval Base. And that's just one example. We've got others. Key West, Naval Air Station down in Key West. Uh, we've got Diego Garcia. Some of you may have heard of that little joy old place out in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and all those are non are non-combat, but still a threat to our ability to defend you, the citizens of the, of the United States. And let's look at overseas and some of the other areas where there's potential. And again, you know, I know your church got uh, affiliated to university here. My mother went to Union University in Jackson, Tennessee, which is a Southern Baptist affiliated. And my wife went there as well. That's where she was when I started uh, dating her, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, these schools are really uh, important. And, you know, my mother uh, was the first one in our family, either man or woman, that ever went to college. And she's the one as a teacher, you know, that encouraged me to go on and, uh, and do the things that I needed to do. And, uh, of course, Union uh, has a lot of mission work as Baptists and overseas. And, uh, you know, I was reading recently uh, about some of the uh, activities that are uh, going on in Africa. And one of the areas that uh, had an impact in Africa uh, from drought conditions, which could conceivably be attributed to, uh, to climate change, is in Mali. And what happened there is you had the Turox in the uh, northern part of the country, uh, you know, it, it had drought, uh, it had been pressured, uh, you had some mi migration of these people, you had conflict uh, with the Christians of the south, and, uh, and what you had was an uprising that eventually uh, the French got involved in. We provided some logistical support with airplanes and other stuff like that. But it required us to become involved in it. And of course, you know, everyday headlines when it's not crowded out by Ebola is Syria. And ISIS uh, that's going on there in Iraq and uh, in that part of the area. But uh, what's not really uh, highlighted is the fact from 2006 to 2010, there was an extreme drought in Syria which caused the mass migration of a million and a half people to places like Aleppo. We heard about that one, that city, where part of the greatest conflict is going on right now. And uh, the Assad regime had not dealt with the drought uh, and with uh, the movement of the people. And then, of course, what really set it off is when he started oppressing the people a greater extent shooting students and stuff like that. Not saying that the drought is what caused the Syrian civil war, but it was what we call in the military an accelerator. It added to it and provided the uh, more of an encouragement for that type of, uh, of event to, uh, to occur. And so as you 
look around the world, and again, you know, again, I, just, I grew up as a Southern Baptist too, and I, I'd uh, go into this, the Sunday school room and I'd look up on the wall, and there was a uh, painting of the Jordan River, and it came back to me when I was in Western Iraq, standing up on the deep of dam on the Euphrates River and looking down the Euphrates, and it was the same scene, you know, beautiful river, uh, green grass and palm trees on, on either side, and, but it was where we had a Marine Corps installation garden that dam. And uh, I was watching a Marine convoy come into the secure area as it rounded the uh, corner coming into the, you know, through the town one of the biggest explosions I've ever seen in my life. An um, improvised explosive device was cooked off by the bad guys. A big black billowing smoke, debris flying everywhere, and I thought the worst, but slowly the convoy came out of it. But what was going on was those convoys represented by the scene that I just showed you in Iraq and Afghanistan, eight out of 10 of them were carrying gas, diesel and all. We have become so dependent you know, on fossil fuels and that type of stuff that it has a security implication for us. And uh, you know, as we uh, in the military look at, okay, you know, there are accelerators, but also, hey, you know, could we be part of the problem in terms of contributing uh, to the gas or the uh, greenhouse gases, could we reduce our amount of uh, stuff that we're putting in the atmosphere? And the, and the answer is yes. And we've got several initiatives that are underway in, in energy. We're doing a great amount of work with solar panels on the installations. Uh, I've uh, worked with uh, in the Department of the Navy uh, with people who are developing biofuels that we can put jet airplanes and we can uh, put ships and operate that. Uh, and again, trying to, uh, to reduce uh, our dependence uh, again on, on fossil fuels and help reduce the footprint that may be contributing to it. And again, it's not about, hey, you know, we're, you know, we're gonna hug the polar bears or, or anything else like that. You know, what we're trying to do is to figure out all the ways across the spectrum uh, that we can contribute to the security of the United States. And that, that's the bottom line. That's what we're all involved uh, in doing, what we've uh, dedicated our life to doing, is, uh, is defending it for the United States. I'm going to step aside for a moment and, and let the Texan. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll come back to you and I'll talk about another, at the end, another element, uh, which is homeland security and we got any ag related people in the audience? Anybody interested in agriculture or anything like that? Uh, come on, this is Indiana. You know? <laughs> I'm good friends with uh, Jim Neighbors who come, used to come here every year and say, home again in Indiana. So. But anyway, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> well, I'm not going to surprise you by saying that I love these Marines. <laughs> What's great about this Marine is uh, he takes the point. So he takes the heat usually too, because some of the things he says mainly about Texans, but <laughs> uh, I am, by the way, proud of being a fifth generation Texan, and uh, I'd have to brag about my great great grandpa, Isakai Benjamin Balls, who fought at the Battle of San Jacinto. Y'all know all about that. I spend town square here in Indianapolis, I saw that. No, I didn't. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh. Uh, I'm sorry. Should I start over, y'all? <laughs> they don't hear me now because they're still sleeping. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think I want to start by telling the students here how proud I am that you're here, that you're determined to, to get a good education here at Anderson, that you are going to do great things. And you're not going to get where we need you a moment too soon. Um, the challenges are great. They're not overwhelming. My faith, and I think I can speak for the general here, in the youth, uh, what we see is, is enormous. Uh, 
I happen to have a couple of grandsons that are college students right now, and I will only say that uh, I think they measure up and uh, they're going to be joining you and solving the great problems that we're handing over to you real soon, if not right now. So um, I also would like to kind of ex expose a uh, an Earth's view that I have, and I got it from somebody that I, I think the world of, one of the heroes of the human race. Um, I got well acquainted with and worked with and actually started a company with uh, <coughs> the second guy down the ladder on, on uh, Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin, and uh, uh, the first man to take communion, by the way, in lunar orbit. Um, Buzz, uh, has described to me sitting in my jacuzzi in my backyard in Austin, Texas with a full moon over that scene and I'm not exaggerating with, with what it is to look back at the earth and come to the inescapable conclusion that it is beautiful, it's fragile, and the resources are not unlimited. And the human race is really in a race, uh, in my view. Uh, it's, it's, um, I'm, I'm not being gloom and doom here, but the human race may or may not survive in the long run. Now, the long run, you can take that out as far as you want to. And as I say, it, uh, the, the, the view that I have of the Earth is that limited resource that is in a special place in the universe that we should be great stewards of, that we need to be careful about what we do. And we need to try to understand the science of what it has happened and what is happening and what will happen. It's very important. Uh, I also agree, and we had some conversations over, over those delicious hors d'oeuvres, <laughs> the Western has some good stuff too. So. Um, now we need to continue to collect data. We need a lot more data. We there are so many things that we need better understanding of. But I also have a a proud uh, father's view of uh, of that um, generation that is behind me but before you and and he's he's working satellites for uh nasa goddard their weather sat their weather satellite satellites but they're really collectors of a great amount of data about what's going on on this earth and there's polar orbiting they're looking at this earth every 90 minutes at a different place and they're capturing that data and they're getting ready they have the they have uh, one that they put up in October two years ago and they're working hard on the next one to go up with more sophisticated instruments and all that but I, I just say that because hey what can I say he's my son I got to talk about him <laughs> but what I'm really talking about is gathering that data that will help our scientists uh, uh, with the with the issues that that right now the US military thinks is important. Uh, why do they think it's important? Well, if you uh, have been in some of the positions that John and I have been in, you know how hard we try in the military to look at the options to plan for the maybe the, the lower probability or the mid probabilities, but to be ready and to really do um, things that are necessary for our national security. And so when you talk about 7,000 installations around the world and the enormous investment that we've made in them, then it's only prudent to look at what's happening in various places where those forces have to operate and to be sure that you can continue to operate there and to be ready for the major uh, changes that you might have to make to continue that, such as with an AT, if if the sea, uh, sea levels continue to rise, and at, and at the rate that they're predicted, 
there are investments that have to be made to maintain the viability of those operating forces. So it's uh, interesting to me that for the last number of years now, the U.S. military, and you know, you, you kind of sometimes get a picture of the military as, uh, 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 as plotting or maybe worried about uh, the wrong things, but in, in a way the military is, is groundbreaking and has been over the years, whether it's the integration of the forces or the inclusion of women across the forces, which we can't really operate without, or uh, in the technology areas that, that's, that, uh, that are incorporated into our uh, daily lives. By the way, GPS might be one of those, which uh, this general can go a long way in telling you about, and I can too, because of what it allows us to do in managing those resources and protecting um, the that that fragile earth that we talk about. Now, I was supposed to be talking for the last 10 minutes already about Asia and uh, that part of the world, but I want to get there real quick and then get off the stage. Uh, a few years ago, I wanted to get back to Vietnam. I wanted to see what had happened since I had been there back in the 60s, and uh, so. My wife and I took a trip down the Mekong River, River, and I only bring this up as by way of illustration because the Mekong River, the river is the sixth largest, longest river in the world, and it's a teeming uh, uh, activity from one end to the other. The entrepreneurs, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, important things going on there for millions of people and fairly peacefully now after a good period of time has passed although you know uh, i i take issue with some of the things that are happening there with the communist party but okay i wanted to see it so i went and saw it that's off the subject the fact is though that china and we talk about water a lot and there's a lot of water in the mekong river is looking at that water as a source of power way upstream and they're talking about 150 dams that will take water. And so if you're the commander of uh, SYNCPAC, which is the commander of all the forces in half the world, Pacific, SYNCPAC, SYNC Pacific, uh, you might get concerned that Vietnam won't take lightly the Chinese taking water out of the Mekong River. So therefore, there's a real potential for conflict and again, we talk about our national security, the security in, the, in Asia and the Pacific and the China Sea and, and that part of the world. And it's just prudent that that causes our planning or the planning of the active duty U.S. military. We're just kibitzers. We're just, you know, but we're just trying to raise the level of awareness. And that's the purpose of my conversation. But the commander in chief of Pacific says, that climate change, and I'll guarantee you he's not a political figure. He's not somebody that has been told by somebody in the White House that this is his highest priority. He says, and his name is Lock, Locklear, Admiral Locklear, that climate change is his most important priority and, and concern. But that's quite a statement. Now, I know y'all are tracking all the storms that are going on in the Pacific right now. The cyclone that, uh, or in the, the typhoon that just uh, hit Japan, the cyclone that is ginning up, the typhoon that's headed toward uh, the Big Island. And uh, I know you're keeping up with that on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Well, we kind of lose track of that, but it really is uh, uh, another indication that climate patterns are changing and the impacts are great uh, and how do you tie that to the US military again the huge typhoon that hit the Philippines uh, a couple years ago with 7,500 deaths and uh, ab absolutely uh, walls of water 45 feet above sea level the one of the real weather experts said it was the perfect storm you know, we've, we've all seen the movie, but that wasn't anywhere in 
close to the category what happened up in uh, Massachusetts wasn't any close to what happened in the Philippines. And so the, the Navy and the Marines responded there. I think the Air Force sent a few planes full of people too. I had to get that in, but you know, it was primarily aircraft carriers. And uh, they went in there and got on the ground and they really worked to straighten things out. Well, interestingly, the Philippines appreciated that. So we were able to sign a new uh, uh, status of forces agreement or, or self agreement with the with the Philippines. It is a part of a mosaic of cooperation with nations in the Pacific uh, that is important and just another indicator of how you tie a huge climate event to national security and I think it's worth mentioning. It wasn't too long, well, it was the 70s, wasn't it, when the cyclone hit Bangladesh. 500,000 people were killed, and uh, 5 million were really forced to try to go somewhere. And, and a migration of that many people is not appreciated by neighbors, so they tend to start shooting. Again, just another indication of how these things can escalate and how uh, the, the fact that the, that the climate patterns are changing is important to the U.S. military. And I think actually it's important uh, down in Texas. I live, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of a, a, a water constrained area. Y'all don't have that problem here, I guess, I heard. I guess Indianapolis has all the water it really needs already, right? No, I, I, I didn't bring up a source of it. I, I take that back. Cancel that. We're not taking questions on that, by the way. <laughs> anyway, in San Antonio, the aquifers are quite depleted, and they're going south uh, even faster. The weather patterns, unless we are blessed with another La Nina, uh, El Nina, the, it, it's really dire. Lake Travis is so far down that the catfish can't submerge. They have to walk on land now. It's that bad. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm hardly exaggerating. So you're blessed with your water, but the weather patterns can have an effect on your crops. It can have an effect on when there's a lot, that may be too much. If there's not enough, that will affect the yields and that sort of thing as well. So. I think uh, uh, if you talk about uh, the city of New York and the fact that we haven't had another Hurricane Sandy since for nine years, they're not sitting and relaxed. They're trying to figure out how to protect uh, from flooding that would be caused by another event like that. And if anybody's betting that there won't be another event like that, I'm, 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 I hope you're not in the insurance business. <laughs> So with that, I'll just tell you again, uh, it's good to be here. I think Anderson is a great place to, uh, to go to school. I would love to make this a two-week seminar and really be able to pick your brains. Both General Castellaw and I were hoping that we could take our iPhones and you could put a, a better playlist on for us. <laughs> I really don't understand the kind of music that we should be listening to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me finish up and then we'll open up for uh, questions. Uh, one of the areas uh, that we're uh, also concerned with is, uh, believe it or not, is, is food security and the impact that it has on the uh, accelerating conflict. Uh, by 2050, we're going to have 2 billion more people in the world. It's going to be somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people. Uh, we need to continue to increase the amount of food and fiber that we produce, not only because there's going to be two, two billion more people, but because we're starting to see with countries like China and with others an increase in the numbers of people who reach the middle class and with that an increase in the requirement of cal calorie intake and for a better uh, food quality of food and the amount of food. And so all this is going to come together and there's going to be an overall 70% uh, you know, increase in the requirement of food that we produce over what we're producing now. By 2030, as we to get to the ramp 
get to where we need to be in 2050. We're going to have to increase rice production by 28 percent. We're going to have to increase wheat production by 49 percent. We're going to have to increase corn production by over 70 percent. We're going to have to increase cotton production by 105 percent. We're going to have to increase corn production, which I see a lot of that around here. Or, I'm sorry, soybeans, which I see a lot around here, by 125 percent. That's just by 2030 to get on the glide slope to feed all those two billion people by 2050. Well, why is this important? Well, I have been in Africans, I'm sure some of you others have been in other locations. I've been in Asia uh, where people struggle to find food to feed their families. People, families that are not, or they're hungry, or unhappy people. They have no confidence in the government. They have no confidence in their society. And they're susceptible to being recruited by people who have extreme ideology and have promised them better days. One of the memories that I will probably take to the day I die is I was in the airport in Washington National. We spent a lot of time in, in D.C. My wife, uh, works uh, in support of both the Army and Navy. She works uh, in a, for the Navy supporting their uh, sexual assault uh, program and in the uh, Army for the suicide prevention program. And so we're still set very close uh, to the military families. But as I was walking uh, toward the gate, I look up and I see this family coming toward me. Uh, little baby, uh, wife, and the father. And the father is walking on two aluminum sticks. And he's got one arm that's all that's left of his four appendages. The other arm is aluminum too. And he's wearing a t-shirt that said, I had a blast in Afghanistan. What a great spirit that they have. But it reinforces the fact that we do not want to fight we do not want to send our precious youth. We do not want to shed the blood that is our greatest national resource unless we actually have to. And so what we need to do is to understand better what's going on with climate change and produce those changes to how we operate, whether it's agriculture or anything else, in order to ensure in this particular case, that we produce the food by our portion of it, we're going to need uh, to feed the world. One of the things we need to do now is, is okay, accept that everybody may not think that climate science is completely set, that there may be some uh, wiggle room. And we say that's fine. What we need to do is invest in the resources that will help us do a better job of measuring what's going on. I read two magazines religiously. One of them is the Progressive Farmer. And what Progressive Farmer talks about is the need to develop seed that's more drought resistant, that's more temperature resistant, whether high and low, and more moisture resistant. It also talks about the need for better conservation practices in order to counter the extreme thunderstorms and downpours that, that we're going to get. The Air and Space Weekly is the other magazine that I read. Last week it talked about, a, you know, we know we can look at the Arctic, see the cap, we see, but we look it down at the Antarctic and we see it at one of the historical highs. We know there's a variation in temperatures with some areas being cooler at times, other areas being warmer. Andrew showed you the graph that shows a continuous rain. Okay, let's go ahead and invest in more resources 
to measure that and get a better understanding of why there's these dips and, and others. Let's be transparent. But the bottom line is in the military, we have a rule that says, hey, about 70% certainty is enough to act on. And right now, this old Marine thinks that there's 70% certainty that climate change is occurring, that human beings are having an impact on it, that we're already starting to see the effects of it, and what we need to do is have a plan of action and start having our own impact on bringing the, uh, the situation under better control and knowledge. Anyway, it's been a great pleasure talking with you tonight, and I think what we'd like to do right now is open it up for any uh, questions and uh, turn it over to Andrew to moderate. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to open it out to questions. I hope uh, we've uh, had it stunned you into silence or anything, but uh, you know, we, we, we threw a lot at you and, and a lot of information and everything, but uh, hopefully we've got some, some questions and we're, we're here and happy to have some, some discussion with you. So uh, I think I saw a couple of hands, one right here. I think it's best to just, just uh, say it loud. All right. Uh, before I ask my question, I'll say that I'm a former resident of both Texas and Tennessee. Great. <laughs> so vote. Yeah, exactly. Which one? Oh, man. Don't do it either. Don't answer that. <laughs> so, well, Sam Houston did, too. Um, uh, but as far as my question goes, uh, typically when people say here global warming, it immediately becomes a political thought, and it's, it's become a topic that's become uh, very mm -hmm. polarized, almost. And do, do you believe that if this was brought up in today's politics where the issue of national security is more at the forefront of this debate, that that would change, possibly sway people's opinions on the importance of this uh, decision? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, had, uh, we met with uh, some of the governor's uh, uh, people who uh, deal with uh, environmental policy and energy today and uh, you know it's always I think extremely positive to meet with people that have a little bit different view than you do and, and what he was getting to I think is exactly what you're talking to is it is it we've got the, such a uh, position in dialogue if, if people feel threatened and they back up and they automatically push out and so what he was saying was, if you would just do this, if you would say, if it is settled, <laughs> if, you know, and to try to be a little bit more, uh, less confrontational. Um, both Derek and I uh, work with some organizations that, uh, you know, they're a little bit more considered, are liberal than, our, than our, the military the organizations. I work uh, a little bit with uh, uh, natural resources Council and NRDC, and they, you know, and the, uh, they asked me to consider being on the board one time, and I looked at, at who was on the board, you know, and it's uh, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, <laughs> and, and, and people like that, and et cetera, and uh, and then uh, you know I went and talked with them, and, and uh, you know and they're saw in a different world, you know, and, and and a lot of that stuff is is more of a cause, uh, you know, that they've adopted than, than it is uh, some of the practical things. And so, you know, I think what Dirk and I have tried to do is, is to, you know, span that gap, is to talk with these people and talk with the ones on the other side and try to create a dialogue. And uh, we found that there's two, uh, uh, venues for doing this. One is to talk in the, uh, uh, in the security environment, talk about how it impacts security, and another one's about business. We went to the Subaru plant today, and uh, as we were walking through there and being told about what's going on there, it was amazing some of the things that they're doing there that will reduce the carbon uh, print and also uh, 
some of the hazardous materials. And the reason they're doing it is, is you know, one, it's it's good pub, but the second, oh, the reason, and the most important reason is it's saving them money. So we are trying to emphasize that security and practicality of the business and get people to, to be less confrontational so that we can get a little movement uh, forward. I just add one, one thing, because uh, I, the military processes a lot of people through, you know, and, and right here is a good example. The logistician who is a great uh, teacher now who loves to teach, but the thing is, uh, we're, the, the military is working hard on this. You can go to any installation and they're working hard on it. I was at Fort Huachuca not long ago. They're building a huge uh, solar array. Now, granted, it's in the desert, so it's getting a lot of sunshine. But it's it's state of the art. It's gonna it's gonna uh, power a lot of stuff at Fort Huachuca, and it's big. So they're on the leading edge. You go right up the road to Davis Monthan Air Base, and they're doing the same thing. They've converted all of their uh, power all of their runway lights, everything is to, to very efficient LEDs, uses less energy, they got a solar array out there that tracks the sun, and right behind it in the distance, there and I have nothing against coal, but there's a coal-fired heating plant that is shut down because it can't compete in, in that environment. So my message is, we're trying to just make people aware. And the military is doing that by their planning and their efforts based on their resource management and, and their ability to do what they have to do as a, as, as a national, an instrument of national security. So the answer is uh, it, it, it's going to help a lot, especially if y'all, you have, if, if your opinions count, you know, and, and uh, just recognizing it as an element that has to be dealt with is an important thing. So, good question. Yes, good question. Great question. Who else? We stunned you into silence. Yeah. And we, we do have a bike. If uh, anyone is wants to doesn't want to shout from the back. Well, while while you're thinking of it, I, you know, I, I think that that question's an important one, and it, it, it goes to why ASP was founded. It, it, ASP uh, is is there to bring the facts to national security debates. We, you know, we're not there to to find uh, you know Republicans and Democrats to agree on everything, but you don't get to have your own facts. Uh, you have to you have to debate from. Uh, a common set of facts, and that, that's what we're, we're here trying to get out and trying to, to talk about. And, and I think we put the, the facts out there as best as we can. Last night we had a question that was interesting because it was, how do you sell this to anybody? And so I want to ask you all <laughs> So, I mean, you, you, we even had a show of hands last night, and, uh, and, uh, and they were, you know, there were uh, thoughtful students like you are, and, and a few of them actually voted, raised their hands and said, okay, we think there is some connection between national security and uh, climate change. We're not talking about global warming. We're talking about climate change. And somebody might say, well, what's the difference? Well, one, you have a, a chance of getting a dialogue going, and the other one, you have a chance of getting a huge political fight going. So that's the difference right there. But, uh, anybody want to yeah, raise their hand and lead the vote here? <laughs> yeah, what, what do you all think? Do you yeah, have I, was, I was just going to ask, do you, uh, just a follow-up to the question that Ryan asked, are you, do you, does the military feel uh, hamstrung by the political debate that goes on? Would, it be, would, would the military be able to deal with this problem more effectively if the political, uh, to, to what extent would the military be able to deal more effectively with this issue if there weren't the political debate going on? The, uh, every year, uh, we have the, in the 
Department of the Navy, uh, we have the Secretary of the Navy is a good old boy from Mississippi by the name of Ray Mavis. And uh, he has uh, made this one of the signature elements of his uh, stewardship of the Department of the Navy. And so he's very much encouraged uh, both the Navy and Marine Corps uh, to do things uh, that would uh, particularly impact the use of energy. Uh, for instance, uh, we, we have backpack solar panels that look like a tent, folded tents. And you go out and you uh, unfold it and uh, you can charge your radio batteries. You know, uh, since we started this little fracas, uh, uh, we've increased the uh, amount of radios computers and infantry battalion by about 380 percent and so now we have a lot of stuff that needs to be charged and the traditional way of doing it has been with generators that run on the fuel that requires those eight out of ten convoys to, to deliver it so uh, backpack solar and little micro windmills that generate electricity <laughs> And Turk was talking, or one of the guys were talking that were coming in about uh, a, a guy who was under a dark cloud now because in the desert it gets really hot and you got these uh, tents uh, that are made out of uh, you know cotton or nylon and they have no insulation. So he came up with the idea of spraying it with uh, insulation. And now the, uh, the uh, supply guys are mad at it because they can't scrape it off, you know, they go somewhere else. Uh, you know, some things work, some things don't. Uh, if you go to through that. Uh, you know, biofuel, uh, every year we've had this battle uh, with Senator Inhofe uh, over uh, funding uh, biofuel. There's an agreement that's between the uh, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, and Department of Agriculture. Uh, about uh, supporting the uh, creation of biofuel refining, cellulosic, so ethanol, and, and so, you know, those type of battles uh, go on. Uh, uh, so, unfortunately, uh, in some cases, it's become a litmus test. You know, you know, if you support that, you know, you're a communist. <laughs> and uh, if you do, if you don't, then, you know, you're a patriotic American. I mean, that's some of those things are coming through, you know, should we spend money on buying ships or should we spend money on trying to uh, jack up the beers at uh, Norfolk Naval Base? Uh, uh, all of those kind of uh, uh, debates uh, go on uh, every year, unfortunately. One, one element uh, uh, of an answer is that most of the decisions, uh, the decisions are based on the payback, the ROI, and so they don't have trouble that I, 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 th I think the Congress on both sides is very receptive, particularly if you have an installation that you want to be uh, sustainable and, and uh, viable in all the base closure actions and everything. And, and, and if it's state of the art on energy conservation, uh, efficient, it's a huge argument and it sails through basically. So I think there's. Yeah, you know, I'd add to, to that too, that my, my conversation with the folks working at DOD and working on these issues is that, you know, DOD of course has a role to play here, that one of the largest parts of the U.S. government and everything. Um, but the questions of how to address climate change are properly a political question, you know, and not a military question. How to address it, the policies of how to address it how to adapt to it, how to spend money on it, how to, um, you know, cap and trade, carbon tax, direct action, the EPA, any number of these things. That's not a military question, and they shouldn't be, and they don't weigh in on, on these questions. That's, uh, those are properly political questions. But, that said, the, the fact of whether or not to address it is an important thing that I think that they, they are weighing in on, and I think uh, rightfully so. And, and uh, notably, it's, it's not just the U.S. military, it's other militaries around the world uh, are, are saying that, hey, a, a, a world of, of unchecked climate change uh, is one that we can't secure in a, a long time, you know, in, in decades from now. 
Uh, you, can, you can look out in 10, 20 years, and of course you can make all the predictions you want, but, but you get, you get a, a long time out and, and a, a world of, of unchecked four or five degree uh, rises in temperature, and that's, that's one that, that you simply cannot secure. Uh, on that right. uh, happy note, let's get let's get a better question here. <laughs> it's, it's actually on your guys' question. I think everything can be broken down to it does matter for national security. The question should be the significance that it has on national security. I mean, even you guys talked about the food aspect of national security. You know, someone coming to this country who has an illness, that's national security. So I think everything can be national security. It's just the significance that the change in climate has towards it. For me to come up with an answer and to vote how significant it is, graphs are great and data is great, but they can be cherry picked as you said. I'm not saying yours were, but, <laughs> but, but they can be cherry picked. So I would need to see more, personally, I would need to see maybe photos of the change over time in the polarized caps or the change in uh, crop yields in different states by the years because of temperature changes or I would have to see more empirical facts and graphs on how it is actually affecting the United States and the rest of the world and what an impact us changing could actually have on it. Well, that, that's good. That, that's a reminder. We've got good pamphlets in the back. We've got a just released paper today on, on climate change in the Midwest that has, has a couple of, of good numbers on there. Uh, one uh, that I, I'll note offhand, uh, you talk about crop yields. Um, in virtually about the same amount of um, acreage planted in corn in Iowa in 2012 to 2013. 2012, you, you recall, was a big drought year. Lots of uh, temperature records set throughout the Midwest, throughout the United States. There was, let's say, it's in there, so you're going to be able to check my, my memory here in, in a second. I think it's 1.88 billion uh, bushels of corn uh, in Iowa. And that's a lot. That's that's the, the most. Uh, that's the biggest in the uh, in the country. But it's 1.88 in the drought year, and it was 2.2 in the bumper crop year of 2013. So that's a significant difference. Now, you know, you can never say one drought, one extreme event is uh, dependent on climate change. But in a world uh, with uh, where climate change continues to happen and goes goes further, that's those are the events we should expect to see. And one of the things we talk about in the in the paper is that actually, uh, for this region, some of the years are going to be better because you're going to have a longer growing season. But those extreme events are also going to ha happen. And the extreme rain events flood out your crops, extreme droughts, uh, extreme wind events, tornadoes, that sort of stuff. So it, it's going to be a lot harder to plan and a lot hard, harder to think about. It. And, uh, you know, maybe that's, that's difficult for us as a, a political uh, situation to deal with uncertainty. But I was recently in Arizona and a uh, and, and the the data there, according to what they were telling me, was it was drier than it had been in 1,100 years in Arizona. So I, I mean, so that's a that's a meaningful number. I mean, that's uh, whether that kind of data is the kind that persuades folks, or you have to be up to here in tidal uh, <laughs> flooding. I, I'm. Or, or maybe just to your ankles, I don't know. <laughs> Part of this, this tour, we went to Las Vegas, and we went to Hoover Dam on the, the Arizona-Las uh, Vegas border, and we saw what they call the bathtub rain, and it is about 50 feet, this is in, in Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam, it's about 50 feet below full, and, and it's, it's approaching the level where they're going to have to start cutting off water to, to people in Nevada and Arizona. Uh, people who count on that water. 